Good morning. My name is Mike Jones, and I'm one of the uh, elders here at uh, Rancho Baptist Church. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And while you're doing that, I want to uh, give us a short history lesson to kind of bring us up to the present, uh, the book of, to the book of Philippians. On Paul's second missionary journey, he and Silas sent out to uh, travel across Asia Minor. Along the way, they picked up Timothy. And they traveled uh, north, made their way, touching in different cities, administering and leading people to the Lord. He worked his way north, and he was trying to move up into the area of Bithynia, which is at the top of the map. But uh, it says in Acts chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit was preventing them from going into Bithynia, they made their way over to Troas, which is the uh, arrow on the right. And it was there at Troas that Paul received a vision. He saw a man from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. So Paul and his companions made their way over and arrived finally at Philippi. As they traveled around Philippi, there was no synagogue, there was no church. And as they walked along a river bank, they met some women, one of them whose name was Lydia, a seller of purple, a woman from Thyatira, and uh, Lydia got saved. And Lydia's whole household got saved. And uh, a little later on, Paul and his companions are traveling around Philippi, and there was a woman who had a demon. It was a spirit of divination. It was used for fortune telling. And this lady kept following Paul and his companions around going, these men are, are uh, 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 for, for, I got it wrong, are men of the most high God. And she kept annoying them. And finally, Paul turned around and rebuked the spirit. This lady was delivered of the demon. And along with that, she was a slave of a, a guy. And so he's losing all his profits because the money he made from her divination was gone. He caused a great riot in the city of Philippi, and uh, Paul and his companions, Paul and Silas, are arrested. They're put into jail, and uh, in the middle of the night, they're singing that old Gaither song, I Believe Something Good is About to Happen. <laughs> I don't know if that was the song, but they were singing and making melody to the Lord, and the, uh, there was an earthquake. The doors, the prison doors popped open. The stocks fell off, and the jailer, uh, his job was to protect the prisoners, keep them uh, from escaping. And to let them escape, he would have paid for that with his life. And Paul and Silas shouted, hey, we're still here. Don't, don't harm yourself. You're okay. And the Philippian jailer came to know the Lord. A church was planted in Philippi. And the events that happened here uh, developed a special relationship between the Philippian believers and Paul. On his third missionary journey, Paul also visited a couple of times going back and forth through Philippians. Now we're 11 years later. Paul is in Rome, and he's writing this letter to the Philippians from a prison cell. He's just received a, letter, uh, he's just received a gift, a monetary gift, from the Philippian church that was delivered through a man named Epaphroditus. This morning we want to see the example of a church that's committed to Jesus Christ and committed to each other. First of all, we want to look at the example of Paul's praise for the Philippians. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy and my every prayer for you all. When Paul prayed for the Philippians, it was with joy because he had very positive memories of uh, his experience with them. His heart was filled with praise and thanksgiving for the special relationship that they had. It was a relationship that had stood the test of time. Eleven years had gone by, and this is really an example of a genuine relationship. 
I asked the uh, Pathfinder Sunday School class, what is it that makes relationships lasting? And these were some of the characteristics they said make for lasting relationships. Accepting each other. Non-judgmental. Wow, ouch. Have, you, have any of you heard of the four spiritual laws? God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. Remember the four spiritual laws? There's a fifth one. God loves you and everyone else has a plan for your life. <laughs> you know, we, we can become judgmental. We slip into that from time to time. It drives wedges into relationships. It divides people. It divides churches. They also said transparency was important. People who are not hypocritical, they're able to share their heart openly and uh, share with one another. Loving one another, that true agape Christian love, that was one of the things that helped enduring relationships. Giving and sharing, honesty, loving the Lord and wanting to put him first in everything. You know, that's especially true not only in the church but in our marriages. A Christian marriage is two people who are, first of all, committed to Jesus Christ, and then they're committed to each other. And when they cease being committed to Jesus Christ, then selfishness pops in, division pops in, they start wrangling and sparks fly. They say marriages are made in heaven, but so are thunder and lightning. <laughs> when Paul thought about the church at Philippi, it was with praise and joy and I believe what gave him the most joy is found in verse 1. He writes to the people who are serving Jesus Christ, the saints and the church leadership. Do you see that? Paul could look back and what, when he arrived the first time, there was no church. Now he could look back and see a church that was thriving and committed to Jesus Christ and committed to getting the gospel out. The church at Philippi wasn't without its problems. If you read through the rest of the book, you'll see that they had some problems. But it was a thriving church. The people were committed to Jesus Christ, and they were committed to each other, and they were committed to spreading the gospel. And then the next example we see is Paul's partnership with the Philippians. In verse 5, Paul talks about their participation with him from the very first day until the present time. This was a uh, partnership that had evolved over a period of time. He, and he could look back and remember the hospitality of Lydia and uh, her family when they stayed with her. And more than once, this church had helped meet the needs of Paul. I just want to read, and you can just stay where you're at in chapter 1, but in chapter 4, Paul says, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction, and you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church spare, shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you send a gift more than once for my needs. This church was committed to supporting Paul and helping him proclaim the gospel. When I... Uh, Look back over the years, Virginia, I can think of many friends that we uh, were good friends that the Lord brought into our lives, and, and we thank God for uh, the people that he's brought into our lives, people who led us to Christ. And then when we walked away from the Lord, other friends that brought us back to Christ. There were a number of friends that supported us when we went to Bible college. I had been, uh, we'd been living on the Oregon coast, and um, people in our church had been encouraging me to prepare for the ministry. I had looked into various Bible colleges, and um, I'm also working in a small hardware store on the Oregon coast, not really making a lot of money. I've got a wife and three kids, and uh, I can't figure out any way that I can afford to go to a, a Bible college. And I was uh, meeting with our pastor. We were accountability pastor. Uh, partners. And I was sharing with them, you know, I'm, I believe that uh, this is the college that God wants us to go to. It was a college that our pastor had graduated from in Canada. And I, I was convinced that Lord, Lord was leading us there, but I said, there's no way I can do it. We don't have the money to do this. And Tom said, 
When we uh, left, we sold our mobile home and we left the money in the bank. Beth and I want you in Virginia to take that money and go to Bible school. That wasn't enough money to pay for four years of college, but over and over, every year, God met our needs. Every year we would come to the Canadian border. After that, our second, third, and fourth year, we would have to show the customs and immigration people that we had enough money to get us through the whole year. Tuition, school, housing, utilities. And we got to the border with less than $700 to our name. And the immigration officer just wrote, confirmed, and sent us on in. I thank God for the partnerships that he's brought into our life and the people that he's brought into our life and that I had the joy of being able to pastor two churches up in Canada after uh, I graduated. And I think we should remember that uh, when you put your money in the offering plate, we're in partnership with a lot of people. If you look at the back of this bulletin, look at all the people that you, RBC, are involved with in helping support missionaries. You know, a lot of churches have a general fund, like the offering that we take at the end of the service, but then they have another whole campaign just to raise money for missionaries and there's usually thermometers on the wall and they sing there's a story to tell to the nations and there's a whole missions emphasis week and they try to raise this money. Uh, but part of our general fund goes to supporting the people that we're in partnership with and that includes our pastors and staff here uh, at the church. And by doing this, we enable these people to focus on spreading the gospel because they don't have to be worried about trying to make ends meet. And so just like the Philippians, we're in a partnership uh, through our giving with the missionaries and other people that we support. And then we want to look at Paul's promise to the Philippians. Look at verse 6. Now, you probably have this verse underlined in your Bible, or you've memorized it. And the verse says, he who began a good work in you will what? Are you not sure? He's going to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, or he's going to bring it to complete completion. God had been work, working in the lives of those people in the early days at Philippi. They'd come to the Lord, and he'd begun a good work. God had been at work uh, on the riverbank as Paul and his friends ministered to Lydia and the ladies there. He had been at work in that Philippian jail that led that jailer and his household to turn to the Lord. And the work that had begun in their lives was the work of salvation. And Paul says here, his promise is that God's going to bring that to completion. God does a work of grace in our lives, and he sees to it that we are going to continue and that that salvation is going to remain efficacious until the day that he returns and we appear in his presence. And we need a promise like this because Satan gets us tripped up or we trip ourselves up by some of the choices we make, and we can feel that uh, it's over, that God's finished with us, that we can no longer be useful to God. But you see, what Philippians 1.6 is telling us is that God keeps us on a path so that one day we are going to be uh, stand in his presence. And I love this verse from Jude chapter 1, verse 24. And 25, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and forevermore. When God saved you, he saved you for all eternity. And everyone who's been truly born again regenerated by the Holy Spirit, will preserve until the end. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Do you think it's possible that Jesus is not going to fulfill the will of the Father? Stan, where are you? <laughs> is it possible that Jesus is not going to fulfill the will of the Father? No. 
verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Jesus also said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give eternal life to them. And they shall, what? Never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given to them, to them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And we sing earlier, Christ will hold me fast. And that was the promise to the Philippians. Paul's promise was very encouraging. It should be encouraging to us. Paul was confident that the very work of salvation that had begun in the lives of those Philippians was going to see them through until eternity when they see Jesus Christ. And then we want to see the example of Paul's passion for the Philippians. Look at verses 7 and 8. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel You are all partakers of grace with me, for God is my witness how I long for you with all the affection of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Paul was able to feel this way about the Philippians because he had them in his heart. He and they were united in Christ. In other words, Paul was saying, you Philippians are one with me, and um, I know it, I feel it, I know it by experience, And even though you're miles away, I have you in my heart. Now, Paul's in prison. He's in Rome. He got lonely. It's not, uh, he probably had visitors from time to time. But even though he had this relationship with the Philippians, it was, uh, you know, they were miles away. He didn't have Skype or FaceTime. He couldn't pull out a smartphone out of his toga and uh, connect with people. And so... But, but he had them where it really mattered, and that was they were in his heart. He was, a pas- he was passionate about their relationship. In fact, verse 8, when it talks about the affection that he had for them, for them it comes from a Greek work, word which means from the innermost parts of their being, his being. Uh, it, can be, it could refer to a person's liver or their heart or their lungs. It speaks of the very core of the people. And the love of Christ poured through Paul and out into the lives of the uh, Philippians. Now, is Paul ever finally reunited with with the Philippians? Well, as far as I know, that happened in eternity. And that is the same hope that you and I have if we never see our Christian friends or relatives in this world. And then we want to see Paul's prayer for the Philippians, verses 9 through 11. Paul writes, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Paul prays that their love would abound more and more. You know, sometimes we can kind of think we're doing okay, and uh, there's not a lot of room to improve. But Paul takes that and, and he raises the bar. And they and we are supposed to develop our love. And not, it's not just supposed to be a warm and fuzzy uh, type of love. It's supposed to be a love that's rooted in knowledge. You know, as, as we know God better and we study his word and we draw closer to him, our knowledge of God increases, we're able to... Uh, Uh, love better and deeper. And he talks about discernment. We need discernment so that we can understand what the will of God is, so that we can live Christian lives the way that we're supposed to be living, so that we can make the right kind of choices that are in step with what God would have us to do, so that we walk the worthy walk, so that we walk in the spirit and not according to the flesh. And that takes discernment, and that's what Paul prayed for for the Philippians. And the result is, if we do this, we will live sincere and blameless lives until the Lord returns. Paul summed up his prayer by referring to the source of all that he prayed for. 
He talks about the fruit of righteousness. Where does the fruit of righteousness come from in verse 11? From Christ. Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you've got your theology down perfect. Is that what Jesus said? You know that old song, our faith is built on nothing less than Moody Press and uh, I was like, <laughs> Ryrie Notes and Moody Press or something like that. You know, some churches are real strong on, on uh, truth and knowledge, but they come up short on love. Now, Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And when we, sh when we demonstrate that to the world, they see that there's a difference in our lives. What the church really needs today, and one of the greatest needs, is for the church to be able to demonstrate the love that Paul was praying for. And you know, Satan tries to get us sidetracked. He'll drive little wedges between people if they're not walking in the Spirit. If you read in Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the, the deeds of the flesh, and there's divisiveness and factions and strife. When that's going on, folks, that's the, that's the work of the enemy. That's the work of our flesh. We're supposed to be living by the Spirit, and we're supposed to demonstrate God's love. But Satan is going to try to drive wedges in relationships. He'll do things to try to trip you up in your walk. And his end game is he would just like to get us distracted so that we forget the mission, our own personal mission, to reach a lost world, but also the mission of our church. But if we're committed to Jesus Christ and we're committed to each other, then we're going to glorify God by making disciples who love God, who love each other, and who live to reach their world for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for people that you've brought into our lives. Some of them right here, other friends and, and close uh, people that we have who maybe live miles away. We thank you for enriching our lives and blessing us through the relationships of people that you've brought into our lives. Help us to be the kind of people that develop relationships that are strong and sincere and genuine and help us most of all to work on our relationship with you so that as we do that we'll be stronger and we'll be able to let that permeate out to the people that we come into contact with. We thank you for your word. Help us to apply it to our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.